everything is pointless. Everything is meaningless. I don't feel sad or angry. I just feel empty. My friends are all acting excited at the good news of another friend right now. I think he got promoted or something, but they don't really care and neither do I. You guys don't really care. Why are you pretending you do? <laughs> Wait, what? Nervous, awkward laughter just to save face. I used to be that way too. Now I couldn't bother. Who cares when all this is pointless in the end anyway? I'm outside now, away from the noise. It's a quiet, snowy night. The street is all lit up, but honestly, if this park was completely dark, I wouldn't care. Hell, maybe it'd even be better. Look at the night sky. People get fascinated by space. I don't really see the point. If each of these stars are the size of the sun or bigger, and most of them have planets around it, then our planet is pointless. I am already a pointless, meaningless, expendable, hairless monkey on the shitty patch of dirt that we call Earth. When you take into account the vast expanse of the entire universe, that exponentially compounds. I'm extra pointless. I bought a revolver a few months ago, even though I could barely afford it. It's just been sitting in my drawer for the past two months, patiently waiting to finally be put to good use. I think it's about time. Why not? None of this matters. Nothing will change in a few weeks or even a few months. Let's just do it now when I get home. I- Sir? Huh? What was that? My mom! My mom! Your mom what? My mom! My mom! Ugh, she's chasing after me now. Go to a policeman or something. Phew! Good, she went away. Looks like she went to go find somebody else to help her. I'm back home now. The revolver is in front of me. It's time. I wonder if that girl found her mom. Or if she went to the police. Poor girl. I guess I'm not completely unfeeling. I'm still capable of things like pity, but even if I can feel sorry for someone, who cares if it's all pointless anyway? When I finally make use of that revolver, none of this will matter anyway. I won't remember anything because I will no longer exist. If I no longer exist, neither does a little girl. At least to me, because me would no longer be around to even feel any shame or guilt. What I did or failed to do with that little girl is contemptible. But if I committed the same act on Mars or any other one of those billions of planets revolving around any of those billions of stars in the sky, and I were able to escape to Earth with no means of ever going back, the only thing existing from that experience being my memories, would it really even matter? Isn't it the same thing if I finally just end it right here, right now? I'll basically be on a whole different planet, a whole other dimension of nothingness, so why then am I hesitating? Why can't I even bring myself to put the revolver in my hand? Man, I'm tired. If none of this matters anyway, then neither does me resting my eyes momentarily before I decide to rest them for eternity. I'm gonna take a quick nap. Huh? Why am I floating? What the hell is going on? What is the meaning of life? At some point, everyone will inevitably ask this question. What am I even doing? Why am I working so hard? Why do I feel the need to impress people? Why am I worrying about life if I'm just gonna rot in the ground one day and everything, including my memory, cease to exist? Every single one of us has pondered these questions at some point in our lives. But have we ever considered the possibility that when we are asking the question, what is the meaning of life, that we might be asking the wrong question? Viktor Frankl, the author of the famous book Man's Search for Meaning, was forced to confront this question head on as the impeccably well-dressed camp guard before him pointed to the right for him to join the other men in line. This was the line for the men who were healthy and strong enough for manual labor, and based on the guard's hesitation, it looked like he barely made the cut. Once they marched off to their destination, Victor asked the man behind him, If they have us in the right line working, what about everybody sent to the left line? Where are they going? Where are they going? You see that smoke rising up from the chimney over yonder? That's them. They're floating off to heaven. Victor would spend the next five years at various concentration camps, barely escaping with his life. He would come to find out that both his parents and his own wife had been exterminated, most likely very shortly after his own internment had begun. In all likelihood, the camp guard pointed to the left for them upon arrival. And that was that. But that's not how Victor experienced it. No, he was convinced that his wife was alive. He needed to live so that his wife wouldn't be a widow when all of this was over. To him, even though he had no idea where she was, how she was, she was very much alive. At the times where he wanted to give up, or things seemed pointless, 
or when running into the electric fence and electrocuting yourself to death to escape the horrors of the camp seemed to not be such a bad idea, something that became a very common occurrence among those who lost hope and just wanted to give up, he thought of his wife, and he kept going. He was responsible for his wife. Life expected him to be a good husband and not abandon her when this was all over. There were many, however, that truly did not feel that they had anything to live for. There was one man that was so convinced that the war would end by March, and when March passed and he still woke up every morning to the same dark hut forcibly crammed in with all the other prisoners, he lost hope. Out of nowhere, he contracted typhoid fever, and within a few days, he was dead. It's almost as if his body gave up when his spirit gave up, and when he completely lost his will to meaning, his body also lost his will to live. There were two other men, both of whom couldn't take it anymore and were about to willingly run into the electric fence, or use some other method to do the job. They asked Victor for some advice. Maybe he could talk them out of it, or give them a reason to keep on living. One man was the father to a young daughter, and the other one was a scientist, who had a series of books he dedicated his life to before being in turn that still needed to be completed. For both of them, the work couldn't be done by anybody else. Nobody could take the place of the child's father, and nobody could take over the work that the scientist had spent his entire career working on. To quote Frankel directly, when the impossibility of replacing a person is realized, it allows the responsibility which a man has for his existence and his continuance to appear in all its magnitude. A man who becomes conscious of the responsibility toward a human being who affectionately waits for him or an unfinished work will never be able to throw away his life. As Nietzsche would say, he who knows the why for his existence will be able to bear almost any how. Victor reminded these two men of this, to not expect something from life, but instead to ask the question, what does life expect from me? When the two men were able to flip the what is the meaning of life question on its head like this, and realize how ridiculous the seemingly very rational question such as what is the meaning of life actually is, things didn't seem to be so meaningless anymore. Speaking of ridiculous, let's turn back again to the story of the ridiculous man. Am I dead? Where am I? There's nothing around me. I guess I'm floating in space and there's a star right there that's getting closer and close to me. Wait a second, I think it's a planet. And now I'm on the planet for some reason. That's weird. Wow, but this place is absolutely beautiful. In fact, it's perfect. Look, there's people here. Wow, they're living in paradise and they're so kind and they're unquestionably accepting me as one of them. They're one with nature, one with the animals, primitive but somehow they seem very intelligent, as if they're naturally very sharp and intuitive. They're, they're amazing. There's no jealousy, cruelty, tears, or anything negative with them. Only love and harmony. They love singing, having fun, and have an embracing love for one another, including me. But then, I had to ruin it all. I corrupted them. I taught them how to lie. It started off very slow at first, but I saw it all. I saw thousands of years pass by as they evolved in their deception, something that I taught them. Soon, out of this small seed of deception, jealousy grew, and out of jealousy, revenge and cruelty. The first blood was spilt, and the people started to separate into tribes. War, which wasn't even a concept that they could even perceive before, now became the norm. They eventually invented science, legal codes, and completely forgotten their past. They even started to call it a dream. The idea that they were ever once so innocent and happy and without war was something that was just so ridiculous to them. I was so grief-stricken at what I had done to these beautiful people. I wanted them to crucify me for what I had done. But they claimed that this is what they wanted all along. I couldn't handle it anymore. And then I woke up. The revolver was right in front of me. I didn't need this anymore, so I shoved it off my desk. Now I know the truth, and I will preach it to the world, and that is what I have done. They call me ridiculous to this day, they call me mad for preaching love and what humanity can be, and since then, I've tracked down that little girl. I will never let her or anyone else like her down again. Viktor Frankl seemed to be quite inspired by Dostoevsky. He quoted him and another proto-existentialist, Friedrich Nietzsche, quite a few times in his book. Viktor was able to live the tale of the ridiculous man within his own life. He was put in a ridiculous situation in which hope and striving for meaning made no sense. How could you rationally strive to live meaningfully when all it takes is for one random camp guard to have a bad day, decide to take it out on you, and your life ends in that moment? 
How could you live meaningfully if all life has to offer you is unfair pain, suffering, cruelty to both you and those you love? And yet despite this hopelessness, that man there is starving. He's not going to make it more than a few days unless I give him some of my rations. I'm hungry too, but I don't need it as much as him. That man over there is losing hope and considering running for the electric fence. Maybe I can share with him the love that I have for my wife and how the thought of reuniting with her is helping me to keep going and he can maybe find something similar to live for for himself. No matter how difficult your situation is, how hopeless it seems, how much life feels like it's taken away from you, how little you've come to expect from life after it's taken away so much, there's always a choice that lies before you. If you have the courage to pay attention, somewhere, somehow, there's someone who needs you. Someone who is the torch that will guide you to a meaningful life. All you have to do is stop looking up into the skies for an answer and look back down at the person tugging at your hand, asking for help. That person there is the meaning of life. They are what life expects of you. Will you continue to seek meaning independently and be perpetually disappointed by what life offers you? Or will you, in honesty, humility, and perhaps even a touch of irrationality, choose to serve life instead? The decision is yours. Now choose.